Does it work? Oh. I'm really good at using microphones, clearly. <laughs> I keep it, I missed an opportunity here. Um, okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our last event for the night. And I am, uh, uh, especially, you know, I, I shouldn't say, yes, I am biased. I'm especially excited to, in, to, I should, to, to introduce this group of students. This is uh, SUNY Erie uh, uh, South Campus's Philosophy Club, and they have they have prepared a talk for you guys, uh, an extremely meaningful talk, and, and hopefully everyone will get involved. And let me just reiterate, they worked on this extracurricular curricularly, uh, and they're just they're just an amazing group of students. I'm very proud of them. I'm very happy to be Philosophy Club's advisor. And please feel free to check out Philosophy Club tomorrow at 1:30 up in the Writing Center. We'll have donuts, and I know you people like to eat. That, that is clear. <laughs> you guys have appetites, so hopefully we'll see you there. So without further ado, Matt, here's the microphone, and uh, everyone enjoy. Thank you, Jesse. So in 1974, uh, Robert Nozick released a book called uh, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. And he said a lot in the book, um, but one of the things he put forward was a thought experiment called the experience machine. And I'll, I'll quote from his book because uh, it, it summarizes it best. Suppose there was an experience machine that would give you any experience you desired. Super duper neuropsychologists could stimulate your brain so that you would think and feel like you were writing a great novel or making a friend or reading an interesting book. All the time though, you would be floating in a tank. You wouldn't actually be doing it, you would be experiencing it. It would be indistinguishable, but you wouldn't actually be doing it. Of course, while you're in the tank, you don't know that you're in there. It's like a matrix scenario. You could wake up from the tank and go, oh my god, I was in the tank. But while you're in there, you don't know that you're in the matrix. Would you plug yourself in and give yourself an artificial planned life, or would you stay out of the machine and live your normal life as is? These are, these are the responses of our Philosophy Club members. All right. So, yeah, and I'm sure you guys can notice the, the picture of Rick and Morty on the front of the handout if you have it. Um, Right, it's a very pop culture reference to this uh, this uh, thought experiment. It's also, if anybody watches Black Mirror, the San Junipero episode, it's also very similar to this. Um, okay, so my personal position is that you shouldn't plug in. If you want to follow along, our, some of our positions are on the back. Um, mine's the top left. And so, word for word I said, so my first premise is that I'm fairly confident that I will be able to have an overall positive impact on the world, i.e., I will be able to increase the overall well-being or quality of life experienced on the planet. And then my second premise is that the right thing for me to do is to have a positive impact on the world. And my third premise is that plugging into the machine will prevent me from having a positive impact on the world. And so the conclusion is that I shouldn't plug into the machine. So that's, that's kind of my position, to put it in as few words as possible. Next up is Donald. Hey, I'm Donald. Um, <laughs> um, I would plug into the experience machine. Um, being a part of real life society uh, comes with a great cost and it's a great burden on society. Um, I actually kind of formulated this a couple weeks ago. I was driving along in my car and I was just thinking about my carbon footprint. The, you know, the amount of emissions and whatnot, the things that I'm taxing the environment and our society by just kind of existing. Um, big thing now is plastic waste and how we're polluting and creating all of this litter and stuff for the earth. But if I was plugged into the experience machine, I could A, live whatever life I wanted, but also B, all the resources that I would have been consuming outside of the machine um, could be reallocated to other people that needed them or whatever. And my waste products, my plastic trash litter, whatnot, it just wouldn't happen. Um, seems like it would be to the benefit of those outside of the machine if I were to go into the machine. Thank you, John. And Andrew? Uh, I'll be here. Okay. 
So yeah, sure, I'll read Andrews. Um, he would be devastated knowing fully well that he would be neglectful and in respect to the individuals with whom they built a sincere emotional tie. Um, inside the simulation, one does not experience pain or sadness or grief. As great as that sounds, not experiencing sadness for me doesn't allow me to appreciate my radiant, oh-so-happy self without an honest reference. Um, yeah. <laughs> kind of need the bad to appreciate the good. <laughs> Hi again. Um, I would definitely plug myself in. And the way I saw it was uh, there are two facts undeniably true about a human's life. There will, be, there will be both pain or happiness and misery in an average person's life. At the end of a life, you die. Undeniably true about every person's life. If you examine the thought experiment from a practical, hedonistic point of view, uh, you have two options. First of all, you don't plug yourself in. You have an average life, you have some joy, you have some happiness, you have some sadness, you have some misery, you have some a mix of both, neither of which is guaranteed. Secondly, you do plug yourself in and you experience continuous guaranteed happiness with no misery whatsoever, and then you die at the end. The result is the same. You die in both scenarios, but the only difference between the two is that one contained pain and misery and the other one did not. And for that reason, I would plug myself in 10 times out of 10 because misery is the enemy and you don't want to experience misery. Hello? Uh, I would not plug myself in the machine. We're constantly looking back in our lives and seeing how little we knew from just a year prior. I don't think we had a blueprint to create a reality that fills our deepest desires and needs. You don't know what you want until you have it. And once you have it, you realize it's not what you actually want. But you learn about yourself every time this happens. So your next path is shaped by that realization. You can't grow and learn about yourself in the machine, but you can't do anything about it. From the moment you design your life in the machine, you're stuck with those experiences. There may come a time that you realize you no longer want a certain pleasure or significant other that you chose, or worse, your whole life. You may not like where you are, and you may want to pursue something new or do something that you normally don't do, but you're stuck. You're only living the life that you created and intended for yourself. Any realization you have on what you truly want doesn't matter because you're on a constant hamster wheel doing the same things your creator thought you would love. Okay. So I do have a rebuttal to that because like if you did create it then you could change it when you got like bored and sick of it because you could just like you wouldn't know you're in the machine but if you wanted something to change you could start thinking about that and it would happen. It would happen. So. But you're doing what you and what experiences you put out for yourself. Right, but they, can, but they can change as you get bored or sick of experiences. Then I have to ask Robert Nozick about that. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think you create it, you create it, and then you live it out in the machine. You don't, you don't create your reality as you're in the machine. No, but that's the well, point of it. Unless you could. It'd be unless a different you, hypothetical. Yeah, because I think yeah, It'd be different, a, though. Yeah. Okay, but for me, I said... We live in a world where choices are limited for most people, and most people will never achieve their best life. But we're going to tell them it's wrong for them to plug into a world where they, where every desire they have can be met. I would plug in. The arguments against the experience machine are unconvincing at best, and they are morally arrogant and self-absorbed at worst. That's harsh. Okay. Uh... I would. My, my, ba my bad. Tough, tough. Okay. So I would not plug in. When I think about making decisions, I try to keep in mind the end of my actions. So from a hedonistic point of view, like Matt, the ultimate end of life is happiness, and this is achieved by maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. Um, there are actually higher and lower pleasures. So someone could indulge in a pleasure, but it would not be the best means to their end of happiness. Um, so the, um, the experience machine is less pleasurable because you're not actually doing anything, you're just experiencing it. So um, in 
in my opinion, that would be considered a lower pleasure and a worse means to the end of happiness. Actually living in reality, like becoming someone and accomplishing something, in my opinion, would be the higher pleasure. So that should be um, something to take in mind when thinking about pleasure and free experience for sure. So I would strive for the higher pleasure and not plummet. And there's a good quote from Westworld. Like, I don't really have an answer from this, but if you can't tell, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, that's like, that's like one of the things I was thinking about, is like, if you can't tell with a lot of your ideas, like, then it kind of defeats the experiencing of achieving things, because you don't know that you're actually not achieving anything. Until you do realize when you go out of the experience machine, or you're making the decision to leave your real life to indulge in some sort of, in my opinion, lower pleasure. Sorry. So, oh, you can hold on to the microphone. I think my voice can carry. <laughs> um, so, if you don't know, does it matter, right? Is that, uh, is that condescending? Almost insulting? It feels insulting to me. Like, if you don't know, it doesn't matter, right? It's kind of like what you tell uh, someone you're lying to. None of us want to be lied to. Is the experience machine a lie? I would say no. so. Yeah. Hey, here, here's, here's, At least you're lying to yourself. But we should practice that microphone rule. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah just, Jackie's the only one I can. Here, here's, here's the way I see it. What a person is, is a pink lump of sugars and carbohydrates inside of your skull, right? That's what we are. And we experience the world through our nerve endings and through our muscles in our body. And if we can simulate that via this machine, this magical machine, then there is no difference between uh, us living our actual life and the, 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 the fake life in the machine beyond you know, guaranteed happiness and zero misery. Yeah, um, along that same vein, um, it's not exactly brought up in the thought experiment. Uh, maybe in like the full text it is. Um, I'm familiar with it from my ethics class. Highly recommend any class with Jackie, but uh, we go over the experience machine in her ethics class. But um, it's one of my big questions kind of for the, the machine is whether or not it can create a true human consciousness. Um, you know, if you're like, what like you were saying with, if you could simulate your biological, how your nerves and your body perceive the world around you and you could just mimic that. Um, I think that there's personally, you know, it's not, again, it's not touching the actual hypothetical, but I very much question the ability to put a true human interaction into a machine, true feelings, true emotion, especially with the inanimate people that you'd be interacting with. Um, I very much question the ability of a machine to create honest perceptions within somebody, but. I did have one question, like, out of everyone here, how many would plug in? Yeah. Raise your hand. Yeah. Oh, hey, guys, yeah, first. Yeah, I mean, no, we, here, here. Yeah, you don't need a microphone. Yeah. It's my job. Microphone walker. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hello. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Dalton. The reason I come to school and the reason I do an education is to make something that these people are talking about, the experience machine. However, there are some things I feel like they're not addressing and I feel like I should elaborate on what m many, including myself, would want to see in augmented reality. First of all, how many of you ha own an Oculus Rift or, an, or something to that effect? Anyone? Raise your hand. Did anyone? <laughs> well, to anyone who don't know, the Oculus Rift is a VR headset, and to our dimensions, VR it gives a limited but somewhat realistic virtual feel. But how what they're experience, talking about is augmented reality, to fully immerse yourself in an environment. But what I like the question is, we only talk about the experience. What experiences would we define as our own? Some of us would want. Some of us, like myself who play video games not just because it's the fun thing or it's the thing that's hip. I do it for the experience to learn to do something. But the experience is saying you're just talking about indulging in desire. How would we know it's not distorted? 
You could be doing something so horrible in those disordered desire, but think you're good. And because of this, should the scary thought of possibly coming a naturally horrible person come to existence? And to the rebuttal of, a, of AI to what you're saying, wouldn't AI need to interact with others in order to understand oneself? You need to understand. In order for an AI to truly become who it is, it needs to interact with people. And it interacts with the people that will influence it. If it interacts with someone who is a truly good person, then it might end up becoming a good person. But if it ends up going with a bad person, their mind becomes distorted and they don't know anything else. It's like raising an infant at hyperspeed to the point where they become a person. Now to what I hope to envision about AR is not just the experience, but what it could do for society. People who are in comas, people who have no lives, can be given a brand new life altogether. Imagine sharing new experiences with whole new realities altogether, making your own reality. Because what cognition is, is how we define our own reality and how we view it. If you think about it, we each live in our own reality. And if you can't tell the difference between reality and what happens in the second life, then is that really a bad thing or a good thing? Doesn't it define to the person itself? In the end, it's not an evil machine or a good machine. It's a tool. So that tool can ultimately become something worldly. People who have disabilities, who are physically enabled, who lost limbs, could be given everything back the intelligence to function in society, to walk again, to breathe again. People who never knew what the life is to begin with could be given one life, an extra life, just like in a video game. Yeah, yeah, I would tell them. Um, thank you, Dalton. That, that goes off what uh, Jason was saying about um, you know those that are that are disabled. Yeah, I'm gonna get to you right next. Um, those that are disabled, you know. They're gonna, their life is gonna be overwhelmingly filled with misery and pain. You know, a bedridden person is gonna have a far less better life than you know, an able-bodied person. And so for us to say, no, you shouldn't plug yourself in even though it will give you anything you could, you could not get in your current life is absurd. Um, and it, it's exactly what Jason wrote in, in his thing. I have a few things to say. Um, my first thing is that um, I wanna look at this Hey, 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 hey. So, you can you can move forward or back, okay? Nicole, sorry for being interrupted. It's fine. You go ahead. I'm used to it. Um, <laughs> um, what I wanted to say was, uh, with regards to the question of disability, um, who are we as I assume able-bodied people to decide? for disabled people whether or not their lives as they are are worth living as they are. Like we have absolutely no right to like project our values of um, able-bodiedness onto them. If they feel that their lives are worth living in their current state, then that something that has to be respected and I don't think we should look down on them as if their lives are somehow lesser in fullness or lesser in happiness than ours have the potential to be. Another thing I wanted to say was with regards to the question of like connection, like human connection, interacting with other people. In the experience machine, it might feel like and look like a, an actual interaction you would have with a human, but there's nothing behind the other person. There's no, you're basically talking to yourself for the entirety of your experience. The people you meet are either programmed in or they're reflections of your own consciousness in a way. So I would say that it's almost impossible for you to have a genuine connection with a person who's who has a mind and a consciousness of their own and i think that that's a thing that i personally wouldn't i wouldn't give that up for anything but i do agree with what jason says uh when he says that it's very a very kind of privileged sort of thing to say oh no i wouldn't do this because blah, blah, blah. 
you because a lot of people have the potential to make their lives as good as they possibly can already, and a lot of people don't. But the fact that a lot of people don't worries me with the, the question of exploitation. Uh, I know that this might be a little bit outside the realm of the hypothetical that we were given, but I wonder like, who makes these experience machines? Is it a private company? Is it the government? Is it uh, some guy in his basement? Is there a way that they can profit off of what they're doing with the experience machine, and how does that affect the people in the experience machine? If it uh, if the business goes under, does everyone have to get out of the experience machine? Suddenly realize that they wasted months, maybe years and years of their lives in the experience machine, and then go back to life as usual. It in the society we live in, this kind of thing is extremely precarious. There's no other way to put it, really. So we'll go Andy and then Alex had something to say So um, I, I missed the very beginning and I just wanted to make sure that I understood the, the hypothetical. In the experience machine, are there no negative experiences? Is it if suffering you want there to be, there are. If you don't want them to be, there are. It's whatever like pleasures or desires you want. Whatever you want in your life, you can guarantee. Okay, I, um, because I just, you know, when you were talking about eliminating all this, the, the suffering and pain, I thought to myself, well, you know, is that really a complete experience then? Because I know that I personally have learned a lot more from my suffering and pain than, you know, than just about anything else in, in this world, you know. But, um, but, but also, um, you know, I really think um, we gotta also consider the, um, the tenuous nature of, of existence here. What you were saying about, uh, you know, what makes up our brains, you know, best definition of truth that we can really come up with is is just that uh, you know it's it's this collection of, of our perspectives put together into um, you know uh, reflecting what our sense data is telling us and to the point where where Nietzsche in beyond not in not beyond the needle in on truth and lies in the extra moral sense says that truths are just illusions that we've forgotten to be illusions so I, I'm not really sure that um, that that there would be much of a difference between a simulated human interaction and a real human interaction if both of them are just processed through these these um, weird these weird squishy computers. Thank you. Okay, I hope I don't mess this up again. But uh, so the the first thing I wanted to say is that. Um, it's not like we're making a choice for everyone, what everyone ought to do. I just tried to think about what I personally would do. So in- Super important distinction. Yeah, so for the person that's disabled, like the Black Mirror episode, Sandra Perro, I think it's completely reasonable for that woman to uh, completely download herself into that simulation because she was paralyzed. And uh, another point is that I, like I said, the ultimate end is happiness. So if the experience machine truly caused or truly allowed that person to live the most pleasurable life, then I think it would be completely reasonable for them to uh, plug in. But for me personally, because I would know that it was a fabricated reality, I wouldn't want to lie to myself, for one, and I think there's a beauty in overcoming the wildness of this world. And the experience machine where we are limited to a man-made experience. So, yeah. Uh, I, want, I want to say two things real quick. Um, one, you're absolutely right. Uh, if a disabled person finds meaning in their life without plugging themselves in, that's absolutely fine, and I wouldn't look down on them for not plugging themselves in. They're, you know, they're more than entitled to what they've been given and what they have to deal with, and if they find meaning in that, more power to them. Um, I, I personally would plug myself in, uh, you know, despite the happinesses I've had, despite the, the miseries, because I would be guaranteed happiness. Um, secondly, uh, back to his point back there um, about uh, personal growth resulting from, you know, pain and, and bad times. Uh, if personal growth is your ultimate goal, then you can program that into the machine as, and you can grow more than you've grown in your current life. 
it would be simulated, but you would grow more than you have in, in a real reality. Well, you, if that's what you wanted, you can, you can put that in there. If you want pain and suffering, you can put it in there. Um, it's, you can have whatever you want, so it's not like an outcome of like, oh, this better outcome in real life. Uh, because you can have that good outcome, you know, amplified in the, the fake reality. Uh, Jackie, did you want to say something? Yeah, just for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, with regards to what Professor McGurr said, pain and suffering, yeah, we, we tend to believe, and I don't think all that foolishly, that uh, uh, there's meaning in our suffering. And is there something totally nonsensical about that? Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's one of the questions that I think that this thought experiment really encourages us to investigate. Um, another uh, just point uh, following off of what you said, with respect to, I think it was a question you asked, uh, what would be maybe a relevant difference in experience between uh, maybe a conversation or interaction with someone simulated versus someone. You know, we wouldn't even have a language for that someone simulated it, it, other than simulation, right? But what would be relevant differences to that considering the process and method by which we would come into contact with them physically, right? And, you know, that whole idea, that whole idea of reducing the authenticity of our experiences to uh, uh, this, uh, like a, a physicalist explanation, it's just never been very satisfying to me, you know? It's just never felt real. Like I think of something like when I feel love for someone or when I feel uh, excitement or when I feel grief or some kind of suffering, for then someone to explain it to me with a, uh, you know, in a, in a database kind of way, someone to reduce it into this physicalist explanation. I say, listen, you know, that, that sounds inventive and it sounds as though you have developed quite a bit in your field, but it doesn't quite define my experience. And, uh, you know, I think that's something else we should reflect on. Maybe we simply aren't intelligent enough to understand the depth of authenticity and what real experience is. Just because we don't understand it yet doesn't mean we should, we should settle for poor reductionistic kinds of definitions that might convince us to believe that a simulation uh, is, is morally equivalent to, to real interaction. Um, I also feel like there is like two major issues that we're not exactly saying. First of all, we're all making it sound like we'll be permanently plugged into this. Not you put thought experiment yeah. sense, though. Exactly. That's what we did in the five to that. Yes, if you plug in, you're stuck plugged in. Exactly. Well, I'm pretty sure you can take the same amount of time. Right. Talk, the like, point is that like you're two years or like you, like you take forever mm -hmm. if you want. Well, my yeah. understanding of it was that you get to come out and reconfigure what you're about to go in to do yeah. again, right? It's that you get to come out for negligible amounts of time, right? Mm -hmm. Like yeah, I think yeah, it's a, a couple really years important thing to nail down on. Years, yeah. Yeah. Right? A couple of years before you come out, wouldn't you be experiencing? Right. Right. Remember the one rule, the one talking stick rule? There's one rule. <laughs> also, we have about 10, 15 minutes. Just, mm -hmm, you know, 10. And I was trying to say is with my understanding of augmented reality and what we understand with VR headsets is that it's just a game, but at the same time, we can quit anytime we want. We can choose to come back, and it could be just going in for fun for like 10 minutes. There's no real saying that you said it could be preset. Who said it can't be just preset for like, a half an hour just to play a simple video game. Yeah, yeah. but once you're in the mechanics yeah. out of normal life, you have to stay. Remember the you talking microphone? Remember the one I rule? I think so. defining the rules yeah. of the thought experiment is pretty important, though, for talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I'm sympathetic to this position. Mm -hmm. that coming in and out is would be great, but that's mm -hmm. not what the thought experiment says. And to <laughs> that, I think that the thought experiment should be looked at more, that maybe we need to look into it a little deeper. I mean, if we're stuck in there permanently, but we want to see our family. Is that something really okay too? I used to feel like people are say, trying to see good, bad, evil, righteous. That we're not even, we're ignoring the concept of itself. And to what you said about it's just AI and it's just you in a mirror. Does it have to be though? Couldn't we just make it that it's just like some sort of MMO where we can interact with other people instead in similar machines? 
if other people are going to use it, why can't we each use it to interact with each other and to translate even from people who can't even speak our language across the world? We could connect to each other in our own ways. All I'm saying is that technology like this could have potential, but is it potential as you make it? Because the experiment machine is defined as experience. You gain from it. In the end of it, you do gain something from it. And from what I hear, there are losses in Twitch. This is why I think that maybe it should be a look at subject, something that we need to ponder at. It's an exciting machine, but haste makes waste. If we rush into the subject, are we not also rushing into our own demise? Because think about it. If it's a permanent stay, does that mean we end up dying in there? Yeah. But also to the fact that if we can remain in there, how long can we make remain of our own consciousness if it's being downloaded? Is it possible then if we download our consciousness to simply stay there even after our bodies are deceased? I mean, the concept would be revolutionary. So I'm just thinking that have we ever thought the concept that maybe downloading ourselves permanently into a digital space possibly gives us the ability to live forever in the life we always wanted, and to receive our own nirvana in our some way? Interesting thoughts. So one of the things yeah, I also like vanilla forget. sky. Go ahead. What was that? Like vanilla sky is what he's referring to. They are interesting. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. I still haven't seen that one yet. One of the things I was thinking about was like how different is the experience machine from like real life. And I know it sounds a little weird, but I was looking at it like a lot of times we kind of bungle when we're going through life. We don't really know what we want. And if the experience machine is giving us what we want and desire, then we're kind of like finding it as we have it. And so the way I look at it is like, well, if you're going through an experience and you don't know what you want, and so it's always changing, you're always getting those little changes. How is that different when you're like having emotions in life and going through a struggle? At times, sometimes you want the struggle, like a uh, professor said he's gone, but sometimes you want the struggle or you want the happiness or you want it to work out or you really don't want it to work out, but you're not like ready to say that. Jordan. Um, I agree with that, but I also feel like in life, when you go through something and you realize you want to go through a different path or you learn something, you immediately change, you immediately grow and you immediately go a different path. An experience machine, you have to wait out those remaining years or whatever until you can reprogram to your next thing you want to do. And, and uh, one more thing um, about the living forever. I feel like, I don't know, I wouldn't want to live forever. Like, if you look at a really good movie, it the one movie lasts like, super good movie lasts like 12 hours. Like, a good movie is about like, two hours long. Like, that's a solid movie. You're unhappy at the end of it. And, um, and yeah. So maybe uh, since there's 10 minutes, we're already final thoughts from yeah. members. And does anybody else in the audience? Yeah, does anybody out here have something to say? I probably don't need the audience now, pretty yeah. much. Um, so two things. Are you guys saying, as in Rick and Morty, where you go in and it's a whole lifetime in 30 minutes? Or is it your no, whole that, actual lifetime of years? Um, yeah, that's not so exactly day like. Day for day representation inside the machine? That would be a question you'd have to like kind of toss to Nozick, the guy that wrote it. Well, um, it's like not exactly addressed, but the assumption is kind of that time would be the same. Okay. Like obviously so if you could go a million time. years in a machine in 10 seconds, obviously it would be jumped in the machine and lives for, yeah. yeah. It's, you were kind of assuming that it would be the exact, um, same amount of time you'd have 60 years left of your life, yada yada. Gotcha. And as adults, I feel like he's trying to say, I feel like we all could agree that everybody would probably own an Oculus Rift if we could, if we all had money to. He says it's fun. And if we could just jump in and out when we could, but I think that's the whole premise of the whole experiment that he's like maybe not grasping is that it's the whole thought of whether it's your whole life or not. You're not going in, you're going in the whole time. Yeah. And you can't just pick and choose when you're gonna plug in to have a really good day and then plug out to be really miserable the rest of your life. It's picking and choosing, being always happy, or dealing with life. Yeah. Not necessarily. You could reprogram it in any way you want them to. I want life's bullshit. Yeah, I but you can't plug out. Right, hold on. I can, I can program all of that if that's what I want, then I can experience it. This is what it is. I, I think the main problem with that idea is I think the main problem with trying to predict the perfect life is that it's very hard to predict the future. So if you're saying, I think the perfect life has a good balance of pain, suffering, and pleasure in order to 
reach perfect happiness? Because I'm assuming that's the ultimate goal of why someone would want to yeah, I don't think go so. through an experience. Doesn't it say perfect here? Then what's even the point of going into the experience if you're perfect? It's, it's, no, it's not. Yeah, no, Absolutely. Well, I think I think the point is that my point is just you can't predict the future. That's my point. I think the point. I don't know. It's, it's getting wild. Thank but you, I, everyone, I, for getting into it. Yeah, I know, right? I think the real point of that is, is that if anyone was motivated to choose a wreck of a life for their experience, then in some conception, uh, or I'm sorry, says it's been a long week. In some degree of understanding, they have defined better as wrecks, right? It is super rare that we're going to choose something, and by super rare, I'm, I it really I can't even conceptualize it. Conceptualize it. It's, we're not going to choose something uh, that that we aren't willed to choose, right? But the word "better" is ambiguous. So if we yeah. define "better" by like heroin addiction, sometimes then that's you what we choose. What you know. Sometimes you choose what you know. Maybe it yeah. doesn't have a value of better or worse. How? Nate, I mean. What? How? <laughs> how what? How does it not have a value? If it's a choice, All right? All actions have consequences. Yeah, well, assuming value is consequences, right? But yeah, insofar as it's a choice, right, we're willing a conclusion. We're willing an end, right? And unfortunately, and I do say unfortunately, it'd be interesting to experience human life in another way, but we are value-oriented creatures. I mean, the concept of value is very ambiguous. It has multi many meanings, right? So some people's values make no sense to us. Some of them we might consider ignorant. Some of them we might consider totally alien, right? <laughs> But in any way that we are directed to choose, we are willing a notion of better, regardless of what kind of association we have with the term. The term can become whatever it is we choose. I was going to go down the road of a psycho path, but I think I'll stop here. But a psycho, <laughs> a psycho takes a lot of, I mean, it, it, even when someone is, is doing psychotic and disgusting behavior, you know, that's our judgment on their behavior in the moment that they will to accomplish it, it becomes the most important thing in their life. And, and this is the concept that maintains moral responsibility over our actions, right? Yeah? Awesome. All right, that's it, I'm out of here. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great break.